Cisco, the Cisco tracks have a, an, an associate level certification, the CCNA, a professional level certification, the CCNP. This is at least in routes, this is route switch. I should stand over here by my foot. I feel at home. Standing over here by some switches. <laughs> Boy, these things are old. <laughs> um, so if you know if you decide that you like the route switch technologies, uh, CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. Um, if uh, if I leave you with anything, I know sometimes money is not always the motiva motivating factor. Where's green? You got green over here somewhere. It's there. Oh, there we go. But I guarantee there are some serious products to be earned with that CCIE. Okay, and I've had guys come right through my class. I had this one young kid, he was 18 years old. Okay, granted, he didn't have a, 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 any experience at all. Went right straight through school. Finished that CCIE right clean out of school. Now, he's probably not going to go and start as a, as a senior network engineer. He's going to have to go you know, pay his dues. But you know, he probably went out and could command 120, 130K right out of school. Okay? That should be motivation to stick to the books and go through the certification process. And I'm not here just to espouse the benefits of making money, but you know, money's not everything, but it helps. You know, it really does. Okay, so within the route switch uh, uh, technologies, uh, CCNA, CCNP, CCIE. Now, what I what I want to focus on before uh, I let you guys. Uh, turn it over to you for some questions, is at least let you know what these other areas, these other tracks are that Cisco has. Because uh, route switch is not the only track. There's also the service provider track. The service provider deals with um, carrier grade equipment. This is where we begin to see if you really like things like BGP and MPLS, <laughs> uh, BGP and MPLS right now uh, will get you about a dozen calls a day. People wanting you to come work for them. Um, there is an absolute vacuum of people who understand these technologies to the degree that they that they need to uh, in order to be uh, productive in a, in a service provider. Uh, environment. What we see happening is that the, the rate of adoption of the MPLS uh, technology, MPLS is a multi-protocol um, uh, label switching, and essentially what it is is like uh, we're putting switches in the core of the infrastructure as opposed to routing, we're switching, and when we, when we switch, we switch at wire speed as opposed to uh, routing, which generally um, uh, is routing happens in software, so it's, it's much slower. And we see the rate of adoption of MPLS uh, far outpacing the number of people who understand MPLS. Okay, so there's tremendous opportunity for people who understand both BGP and MPLS. Now, unfortunately, um, it's, it's not the kind of thing that you can just go out and you know read a book and be able to go tell somebody, okay, I understand BGP and MPLS. You have to practice this stuff. But the the, uh, the equipment is available to practice BGP and MPLS. Okay? You can get the equipment. You can go buy stuff on eBay for a uh, very small amount of money. Those the 2500 series routers run BGP. Okay, so you can build a small lab. You can buy those routers out on eBay for $25. I know as students, uh, $25 might still be a lot of money, but um, you can buy the equipment relatively cheap, and you can also uh, rent equipment and there's also software that's available that we, that will emulate that equipment okay Dynamics and, and DNS things like that you can actually go and build a uh, an emulation environment to learn these technologies okay so some serious big dollars to be earned if you understand BGP and MPLS these are the service provider I'm talking about like the AT&T's the uh, the T-Mobile's of the world okay if you if you find that you want to go in that direction and while we still have 
uh, MPLS on the enterprise side of the cloud. Here we have a service provider. An enterprise. Enterprise being, uh, uh, this is your this is PSC, okay? And this is uh, AT&T over here. You know, we all have, you know, while, um, while PSC does have a substantial amount of our own fiber, you know, we still do have to interface with the service providers ourselves. Uh, and, and we do have the, um, the customer edge, the CE and the provider edge uh, devices. So, you know, you still have to interface with the uh, provider edge devices uh, with your own CE equipment. So there is a small amount of configuration to do, uh, BGP and PLS configuration to do on a, on a, um, uh, on a CE router, but uh, not to the extent that you'll see in the service provider field, okay? So if you find that you, you know, while you're studying, you find that you like this, you want to understand BGP and MPLS, this is going to be the direction you go, service provider. Okay, let's go back to, so route switch can pretty much go either direction, okay? You can go enterprise or service provider and route switch. Um, within the uh, route switch uh, arena itself, there's a tremendous amount that we can do with regard to uh, security. You might find, on a, unfortunately, People tend to tack security on as an afterthought. Where if you uh, exist in the world that I live in, uh, we see it a little differently, and that is it should be viewed more as a system. Uh, a system that good security should promote good design. It should not impact design, okay? And uh, unfortunately, there is only uh, there's only about 200 uh, security CCIEs in the nation right now. And for that reason, again, real big bucks, okay? There's about 2,000 uh, security CCIEs in the world today. There's about 24,000 uh, route switch CCIEs. So if you want to um, walk down the path less traveled, you might find that working with the uh, Cisco security technologies is the way to go. If, if you if you think that you want to work in uh, network security, then Cisco network security is really all there is, as far as I'm concerned. I, I taught the CISSP material. I taught the security material. I'm going to sit for the CCIE lab in San Jose. I've already passed the written exam. Okay, I'm not coming to you with. Uh, uh, just information that I've read in magazines and books. I guarantee there's nobody that knows network security like Cisco CCIEs. There's nobody out there, don't let anybody else tell you any different. So if you think that you want to go computer security, Cisco security is the only way to go. When we have our IT security <coughs> guys come in and they talk, start talking to me, you know, that uh, I work in the network group, securing our routing and switching infrastructure, and we have our IT security guys come in and they, they start to kind of poo poo our Cisco equipment. Um, I, I ask them, um, well, how do you stop a, 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 a VLAN hopping attack? How do you stop a double dot on Q tagging attack? How do you stop a DHCP exhaustion attack? You don't exist at layer two. Everything you do with your firewall is all at layer three. Okay. How do you stop a man in the middle attack? And when they have no answer, um, I basically just rest my case. Okay, so if you really want to think about network security, uh, Cisco network security is the way to go. And just like any of the other uh, tracks, we start with uh, CCNA security. We also have CCNA wireless. CCNA uh, design, what they call CCDA. CCNA voice. So you start with the CCNA in, in any of these tracks. You might find that you really like working with the IP phones. Now the, the, the IP phone technology has, I will say, it certainly has matured. The market has responded to the, the, the demand for uh, uh, IP telephony engineers. 
Um, there are a lot more today than there were uh, six years ago when I was looking at this material. Um, so they don't quite see the salaries today that they saw six years ago, but have no fear, that train comes by again. Right now, we're starting to see things in the popular press that say, is 802.3 Ethernet dead? Is this the end of 802.3 Ethernet? What's going to replace 802.3 Ethernet in the access, in the access uh, architectures? Understand that uh, we're working with a, a tiered hierarchical infrastructure, core uh, distribution aggregation access. And in the access technologies, now granted, while well, we're still going to probably see Metro Ethernet uh, on the WAN side of things, and uh, 10 gig and possibly even faster speed Ethernet uh, through the core. Um, in the access technologies where I'm living, uh, wireless is beginning to become very pervasive. And guess what? Our peers are not keeping up. What does that mean for you? Loss of supply and demand? A little bit of my econ before I turn it over to you guys. What do we have here? A uh, quantity, quantity demanded. This is P. This is uh, for, this is dollars, right? And um, uh, quantity demanded. And how does it see the demand is downward sloping, and the supply is upward sloping. Is that right? And as the demand increases, we go from uh, P star, right? Isn't that right? As quantity demands, uh, quantity demanded increases. Go from Q star, okay? Um, so as that demand curve pushes out, it drives that equilibrium price up. What that means for you is more bucks, okay? And so right now, um, the wireless technologies, we are just starting to see uh, that wireless can be deployed uh, faster, cheaper, and it's now faster than our 802.3 Ethernet connections if we're still running 100 meg uh, to the desktop. Because right now, the end technologies can deliver with the, uh, with the beam forming uh, technology, we can deliver up to 300 megs. You're talking about even more to the desktop, okay? Right now, the, hard, the problem I have is keeping people off the wireless and getting them to stay connected to the wired network because the wireless is that much faster at PSE, okay? Um, let's see if I can find something real quick. Okay, you're gonna verify this for me, right? Okay, what I'm going to do, what I was going to try to do is show, okay, see all these? One, two, three, that was a call going out, three, and that's called four. Notice, notice the area goes by six. Seven from the Philippines. Eight, nine, ten. Okay, I can keep going. These are all calls from people who call me every day that want me to come build their wireless infrastructures. And that's just one day. Okay. Right now, uh, on the table, MGM Grand, Bellagio, down in Las Vegas. Okay, right, that's one of them. Amazon is another one. Okay, just a couple of them. So you can't go wrong going to the wireless field if you want to stay busy and make a lot of money. Okay, you might find that rather than actually configuring stuff, you more like designing it. You really cannot go wrong 
an architect position either. This is where you really begin to learn the nuts and bolts of how things fit together. You prepare the design and you submit that design probably to a, a, a chief architect and then that design goes out to the, the guys who actually do the configurations. Okay, so within the world of Cisco, there's a whole bunch of different directions you can go. It's not just route switch. Okay, it's not just dealing with these switches and playing with the routers. This is where it begins. This is why you have to go through this. This is why you've got to cut your teeth on these pieces of equipment. Because while this is the beginning, there's a whole lot more out there. And it, it represents uh, very, very lucrative uh, positions for, uh, for your careers. Okay? So I, I hope that at least I've got your attention um, and that maybe you'll think about following this, one of the Cisco tracks because there's a tremendous amount of work out there. Just go out to Dice. Go out to um, uh, what's Monster or Career Builder and just do a search for Cisco and look at how many jobs there are out there right now. Okay? And I know that you guys are getting ready to finish up your program here, some of you sooner than others. Um, if you want the phone to start ringing and have people calling you instead of you having to go bang on so many doors, this is a really good place to start. Más preguntas? Questions. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so, comparing um, the proliferation of wireless technology across the United States versus the proliferation of fiber optic cabling to the door, which do you think will will win? There are two different, two distinctly different areas, because while fiber optic to the door will probably win, four uh, G is probably not going to go away in terms of the, uh, of the homeowner, but understand every single one of those rooftops out there is going to be providing both corporate as well as guest wireless access for you to come in with your iPad, your iPod, every single device under your Blackberries, every single device under the sun that can connect to your infrastructure via wireless. So while fiber optic to the door may be the solution for uh, uh, internet access to your home, we'll probably not see necessarily see fiber optic to every single desktop. The wireless technologies in the access layer uh, are probably going to prevail. So I would say you could probably go either direction in that case. You're not going to find one surpassing the other. They will both uh, continue to um, uh, increase in, uh, in their deployments. Yeah. So the wireless is cheaper to actually put out there. It's yeah. cheaper for them to run. Yeah. So the profit margins, because they're charging more for the wireless for the most part than they are for, my 4G is going to cost me more per megabyte than having that uh, at home. Well, understand that I'm not necessarily talking about 4G as much as I'm talking about like uh, uh, 802.11 technologies, right. 802.11n. And, uh, and what it will eclipse 802.11n. I'm thinking mainly in terms of uh, uh, enterprise wireless as opposed to uh, what we see on our handhelds, okay? Enterprise wireless. So when you go into an organization, it's right now, for example, we provide uh, both wired and wireless for guests, contractors, and employees to support both voice and data. So we'll need to be able to, just for example, the Blackberries. Um, it's a lot cheaper to run that on an 802.11 network within your organization than it is to let it stay associated with uh, the Blackberry server and uh, use 3G or 4G. So we just set the Blackberries up so that they use the wireless infrastructure when they come into PSE. Okay. Yes, sir? I'm fairly ignorant to all this, but I'm 
the wireless security, is it the same as the fiber optic security as far as how you design it, or is it like totally night and day different? No, well there are things, there are certainly similarities, but there are definitely differences as well. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with wireless and security, we have to be able to prevent the guy from sitting out in the parking lot with a plumber's logo on his truck with a big old pipe aiming right at our access point, setting up, you guys know what a can antenna is? For the Pringles can antenna? Okay, I, what's that? That's a Yagi? Is that right? Is that a Yagi? Or a, it's certainly a directional antenna. Well, it, it's, it's very easy to sit out there, and if we don't have our wireless infrastructure set up correctly to uh, potentially, I shouldn't be telling you guys all this stuff, but <laughs> potentially, we'll say, to, to take a one access point offline, uh, a, a legitimate access point, to masquerade as a legitimate access point, was referred to as a rogue, okay, and to get people to associate with, with that rogue access point, uh, now instead of a legitimate access point, and now we've just perpetrated a man in the middle attack, okay? So now all traffic that's coming, you know, between uh, uh, point A and point B is gonna come through me first. Okay? And there might be all kinds of good stuff that I can uh, sniff off that network. Okay, so uh, basic network security is not going to go away. I think what the, the best way to answer your question is there, with respect to the wireless, there will be more things that we have to think about securing. So there will be, uh, it will be more of a, a superset Okay. okay, or that network security outside of wireless will be a subset of all there is to know. And in fact, when you get the CCNP in, uh, uh, in wireless, one of the classes is, uh, and exams, is advanced uh, wireless security that you, that you have to uh, have pass that one as well. We saw five exams for uh, the CCNP wireless. Yes, uh, So, uh, in your opinion, uh, when we're thinking about buying a, a laptop with a Wi-Fi card built into it, and we want to, as consumers, go uh, surf at uh, Tully's, um, what kind of things should we be looking for in our... Intro Super AG wireless cards. Okay. They, there are three chipsets uh, in all of the wireless world. Uh, Cineo, Prism, and, and Aethros. Okay. Uh, the Cineo and Prism chipsets, and all, now all wireless cards, have got one of these three chipsets in them. Um, the, the Snail and Prism chipsets are more what I would call like commodity grade. Okay, the Athros is more of a commercial uh, uh, enterprise grade. The Athros uh, Super AG radios are the radios that uh, that come in the Cisco equipment. I'm not selling them just because they come in Cisco equipment. They just plain and simply are better. Um, I set up the, uh, the, uh, the internet service provider up in Sandpoint, North Idaho. I'm sure if you guys have ever got a chance to go up there to Lake Ponderé and uh, visit that area. If, if you haven't, I'm get on up there sometime in the summer. And it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, it's almost like Lake Tahoe was, what, 20 years ago? Uh, it's just beautiful, pristine lake. Um, I did a 17-mile shot across Lake Ponderé from the top of Schweitzer over to uh, Hope. Um, using the Aethro Super AG just on, on a 2.4 gigahertz wireless. That would be pretty much unheard of if we were in, uh, granted we did, have, we did have some big old 24 dB directional antennas and stuff like that. And it's, that is in no way anywhere near what the record is. I think the record is like 125 miles uh, with just 2.4 gigahertz equipment. They literally had to put the antennas up uh, above the curvature of the earth just because you know, we had to deal with, uh, with those problems. But, if you're going to be looking for specifically something in a wireless card, I would be looking for those Aethro Super AG radios. All of my laptops are Fujitsu because I know they come with Aethro's radios. Thank you. Yeah, they're good. They're good radios. I'll spray with this. Um, I want to say something. Else. Um, by the way, congratulations on the season, right? Oh, thanks. Well, I'm um, not quite there yet. I haven't, I haven't joined the club yet, but I have passed the written. Thank awesome. You. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm one of the instructors from the network program. And I just thought maybe you could share with everyone with the uh, IPT6 day coming out in June. Um, what are the different plans, what are the different uh, hurdles that Cisco is, is focusing on 
prepare for that day, and also with the proliferation of wireless um, and access points and infrastructures, what does IPv6 mean to that? It's in all of the exams now. So basically, learn it. Um, yeah, we don't really have much choice anymore. You know, for years uh, we could get away with uh, RSC 1918 private address space and uh, NAT in every incarnation: uh, NAT, PAT, DNAT, SNAT, whatever you want to call it, dynamic NAT, static NAT. Uh, well, that was nice. Those days are gone. Okay. Uh, you basically the bottom line is you got to learn the IPv6 uh, uh, addressing um, technology because if you go sit for uh, CCNP, I don't believe they they hit they hit it in the CCNA yet. But any of the professional exams, whether you're talking about voice or route switch or service provider or security or wireless, it's in all of them. Okay, so they're they're gonna they're gonna drag you kicking and screaming. Uh, whether you like it or not. So yeah, you're gonna to have to learn it. Yes, sir. Uh, with IPP, uh, IP6, um, do you even need to worry about routing anymore since everybody can have their own IP address? If it's well, public? of course we have to learn about routing. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah, just because you have your own IP address, we still gotta get from A to B, right? Okay. We still gotta tell, you know, if, if, if you're in China with an IPv6 address and you're in, a, in America with an IPv6 address, uh, that traffic's gonna have to go through a number of hops to get from uh, America to China. And it's, it's routing that is going to, uh, to get us there, absolutely. Okay, I guess I, I didn't clarify. Um, what about, do we have to worry about subnetting anymore? Oh, well, subnetting's not gonna go away. Okay, well, now granted, while we have, uh, there's enough IPv6 address space to uh, not have to worry about uh, making little ones out of big ones, okay, breaking your slash 24 into multiple uh, slash 28s and so on. I used to, in fact, um, if you guys, here, here, quick, question, quick question, here's how to learn, uh, a, a way to learn how to earn beers uh, with your friends. Um, <laughs> go into uh, the bar with your, they gotta be some of your geek buddies, uh, this, or else it's not gonna work. <laughs> but, um, uh, what is the, what is the, Third, what are the first two usable addresses in the third subnet? If I were to give you this, tell me the first two usable addresses in the third subnet. Okay, you got to have the answer by now, or it's not going to learn. Okay, so in the end of class, if you guys haven't figured out how to do that yet, I'll let you know. Basically, if you you got, unless you've lost any fingers, okay, you got eight fingers. So you can sub them um, very, very quickly, in fact. By the way, about eight seconds is all you should have needed to get that answer. Um, with respect to the question, slash, uh, uh, I should say, um, uh, IPv4 is not going to go away overnight. Okay? It's kind of like frame relay. You know, we're, out, we're all learning MPLS now. Um, but frame relay hasn't gone away yet. Okay, so, and in fact, there's still a tremendous amount of uh, uh, information that's required to, uh, to about frame relay to pass the CCNA exam. So it's not like you can learn IPv6 and forget about IPv4 subnet. Okay, it's it's, it's going to be in a lot of places for quite a while uh, before we make the conversion. Okay, so granted, while it's going to be mandated, um, everyone's not going to you know, you're not going to wake up one morning and say, oh, I've got to redo everything in IPv6. Okay, so it's going to be around for a while. So I'd say, yeah, you know, make sure you know how to subnet. Yes, sir. Well, from what I'm seeing, the subnetting logically, maybe you won't need to do that, but subnetting physically, like with neighbor discovery protocol and things like that, you're still dealing with subnetting. You're, you're still dealing with subnets, yeah. Okay. You're, you're still going to have, uh, while you don't necessarily have to have RFC 1918, private address space, you're still going to have networks that are very hierarchical in nature. For example, OSPF v3, which is OSPF using uh, IPv6, is still going to have to be very hierarchical in nature. We're still going to have to have uh, route summarization. Um, we're still going to be breaking big ones into little ones, so it's, it's not going to go away. It, but it's not going to quite be the same thing that IPv4 or something. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
that. Now, essentially, the bottom line is uh, we, we take one big chunk of address space, and as we, as we divvy it up among the organization, uh, those we, we generally don't want to have a, what we call a flat network. Okay? We're, we're going to take, if, if we're talking IPv4 address space, uh, we'll take a slash 24, okay? <coughs> We'll break it into what two slash? Okay, so something like something. Chris, we'll break that up into two slash twenty fives. Okay, how many addresses in slash twenty four? Two hundred fifty six. Two hundred fifty. Two hundred fifty zero to two fifty five. Okay, um, slash twenty five so just breaks it up into two chunks of one hundred twenty eight addresses each. Okay, and so while you know, while we might have uh, a single slash 24, we might have like one building here and one building here and uh, a router here and a router here. And this guy's responsible for uh, his 128 addresses and this guy's responsible for his 128 addresses and, we, and summarize them accordingly. Um, so just like it was mentioned, while we're not gonna have IPv4 subnetting, uh, the, the concept of breaking a big one into little ones is, is not going to go away. Last okay. pregnant? Yes, sir. Can you tell uh, a little bit more about Cisco Voice and what certifications needed and uh, what kind of jobs in this field and, you know, what to play? And just you know, kind of uh, there, there are, I could talk for 30 minutes just on voice alone. Pizza here. Because once you get into voice, you start dealing with call manager and operating the server that is basically, it's equivalent to like the PBX of, uh, of yesterday, okay? Then within, uh, within voice, so, so we have like call manager. Oh, and I would definitely focus on uh, virtualization in no matter which area you go here. You can't go wrong understanding virtualization, okay? In Cisco world, that's the UCS technology, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go virtualization in Cisco. All of my stuff that I virtualize, I do with uh, VMware, running uh, ESX uh, 4.1. Um, and a lot of these appliances, for example, the call manager, this is where I just what made me think of this, call manager runs in, in, in an ESX 4.1 uh, VM, okay? So uh, you, can act in, in, you can download the software from Cisco. While it might be a very, very expensive, uh, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 20,000, depending on what some of these pieces of uh, software are, you can go get 30-day eval copies and get an eval license and get your ESX 4.1, put it on your 64-bit machine or 32-bit machine, you can get either version, and run a copy of Call Manager and start learning it that way. Okay, so you can get this. And you didn't learn it here, but uh, when that uh, eval license expires, just build another one. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like some software that, you know, once you install it and 30 days runs out, that you can't run it on the machine anymore. Okay. And they won't, a lot of times they will not advertise that this stuff is running a VM. But I thought it was very uh, funny one day, not funny, haha. -ha, but uh, when I started loading uh, my Cisco Secure ACS uh, server, which is the, um, the access control policy server, it basically is what uh, um, it's going to provide the access control to people logging into the network, whether they're logging in wired or wireless, uh, or coming in by a VPN, it doesn't make any difference. And as it was booting up, it looked like I was booting one of my Red Hat Linux machines. I thought, what the heck? This thing is running freaking Red Hat Linux. And uh, it became apparent to me that um, it was running on Linux. And so uh, a lot of this stuff, and they don't advertise it. They don't say, hey, you know, if you know how to run Linux boxes, you can go ahead and run this on your head. No, they don't say that. But Rest assured, the majority of the stuff that they're running now, these appliances, CSACS, Call Manager, all these things run in VMs. So Call Manager, this is the server that controls the phones. You can, you, you can go, um, and, and this would probably be like the CIPT, if, you, if you're looking at the exam series, uh, CIPT 1 and 2. Um, 
the guys, uh, oops, one and two, the guys who are running the call managers today are probably, let's see, Walsh. Walsh is probably making 110, 120, 130 grand for knowing how to run that server. Um, uh, you can do the C, what is it, CI, uh, let me think, the contact manager. I'm trying to think that there's uh, Unity, which is the voice messaging system. Um, and I, I, I have to apologize, I just don't know the acronyms for some of these. I just haven't gone off in that direction. Uh, at least done a deep dive in that direction. But a Unity is the, uh, is the voice messaging. They call uh, 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 the uh, voice. Shit, I, I, I forget the name of it. It's uh, VRs. The automated voice response. Okay. The, that's not that's that's not the acronym though. But it, it's you know when you when you call somebody and uh, it says you know so and so is not here, uh, leave a message. Okay, it's it's that. Uh, Unity is the is the Cisco. Uh, Product. Um, the other one is uh, Cisco Contact Center. Uh, and there's uh, there's probably about two or three more other directions that you could go. Um, I'm sure that there's at least one more. I, again, I just I haven't done the deep I haven't done the deep dive. We have a whole voice group over at PSE, and they don't let me touch their voice stuff. <laughs> They're, uh, they're all union guys, and there's a, there's a union thing that goes on over there. Um, so there are like three or four different directions that you can go and specialize in any one of those. So you're talking about like a, a Cisco will have their server and uh, I guess, uh, uh, you know, IP phones all over the building or, you know, throughout a few buildings in the organization. You're talking this stuff? Or um, what about the... The wireless carriers, do they use some Cisco equipment as well in their networks? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Either Cisco or Juniper. Uh, Cisco and Juniper are the two big carrier uh, grade vendors. And within the uh, within the wireless side of the house, um, there's also the, the Cisco wireless phones. So it, it basically keeps people from having to worry about carrying their Blackberry. Uh, and essentially the way all the pieces snap together here is that the, the call manager is what uh, sits on the back end and uh, is, where all, is where all the phones register and in these other applications that I was, that I was mentioning, Un, uh, Unity and the contact center, these are applications that run on call manager. There are separate applications that just provide additional value. So, uh, and they might not call it Unity, they might call it Unified something. Uh, in fact, this is now a CU, CM, Cisco Unified uh, Call Manager, and then it also has CU, CME. We can actually run a, a call manager on a router. So if you want to experiment with uh, doing like a voice, Cisco voice, you don't actually need to go out and buy a call manager or, or deploy a uh, uh, one in a VM. You can run CUCME on a router and and get your IP phones to register with uh, CUCME. And so all of the phones are registering with either Call Manager or with uh, CUCME. And the other pieces are uh, just additional appliances uh, or uh, applications that run in VMs that uh, add value to the, the whole system. Does that make sense? Um, I know that VoIP is new to Packet Tracer, but if students have Packet Tracer, I can't remember, is Call Manager actually in one of those devices? Uh, no. No, it's the Call Manager application is gigantic. There might be some uh, form of emulation yeah. for Call Manager, but it, it's, you're certainly not getting a, uh, like a, a version of Call Manager. Just, and just like you're not really getting uh, frame, re you're not really getting a frame switch in there either when you develop your frame relay. Uh, um, uh, labs, it, it, it's, an, it's an emulation only. But I mean, it, it might be enough for you to uh, at least be able to experiment. CUCME uh, Express is probably the best way to go if you want a real uh, live version of call manager running on a piece of equipment that you can have IP phones um, registering with. Let's get 
give John another round. Uh, and uh, the pizza is here, so we don't want to keep that waiting. Um, but John will be here for a little bit still sure. yeah. to answer some questions and do some networking. So um, the other kind of networking. <laughs> so uh, he charges too much for this. Uh, so please come up and uh, chat with him. Um, Oh, no, they don't give me business cards. Okay. They generally don't even let me out of my office most of the time. <laughs> they keep me, I'm, a, I'm actually a, 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 what they call it, an R&D analyst, where for the most part, they, they keep me sequestered in this little tiny space and don't let me out very often. We are honored to have you here today. Uh, so we'll bring, that, we'll bring the pizza in over the table here. How many are there? Um, the Lord. Maybe let's have them out here. <laughs> I think I have a...